I'm excited now to bring in Ben Opal, Senior Director for Customer Solutions Engineering at Attack IQ. Hey, Ben, are you there? Yeah. How's it going? <laughs> going great. It's good to have you on the EcoCast, Ben. I'm excited to learn about Attack IQ. Take it away. Absolutely. So, um, how's it going, everybody? Um, as introduced, my name is Ben. Uh, and also, as introduced, I work at Attack IQ. We're a breach and attack simulation company. Um, I'll talk to you more about that later, but not at length. Um, I wanted to call something out here because I had the chance to listen to the uh, previous speaker, the last, last 10 minutes or so of his talk, which, by the way, was great. Um, and he made reference to um, ransomware no longer being something covered by cyber insurance in the future. And I think that's a fantastic move on the part of the insurers. Um, for various reasons. Uh, I'll kind of get into that as I talk. It's apropos uh, of what I'm getting into today, because <clears throat> what I want to talk about is, as you see on the title slide, seeing the forest for the shiny new threat trees. Um, and that's because the thing that folks should consider going into 2022, I'm not a New Year's resolution guy, but um, you know, it's a good chance to really take stock of what's going on in your life and or your security program, is to stop putting so much stake in single threats, in timely or, dare I say, shiny new things that come down the threat intel pipeline or, God forbid, um, from the news. So <clears throat> with, that, with no further ado, let's be about it. What I'm going to talk about today, you know, um, what do we do in security? What's our thing? Why, 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 why do we do what we do? Um, then we're going to talk about, um, somewhat strangely compared to what I just said, uh, we're going to talk about designing an emulation plan. Okay, and we're around a, uh, a maze ransomware capability. I'm sure many of you are familiar with maze ransomware. Uh, they'll talk about some additional resources and training, and, I, and I'm going to make a point at some point throughout these slides. So just you know, don't worry too much. So <clears throat> the goal in our line of work is to get good. All right, we 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 are here to protect something. We are here to secure company assets. We're here to secure a mission, um, and we cannot afford to be scatterbrained while we do this. We have to be very focused. We have to understand very clearly what it is we are defending against and what we are defending. So why test? Well, because if you test, you understand where you stand. Uh, if you don't test, you are flying blind. All right, now you test so that you can answer that question that every security professional the world over for since time immemorial um, has been unable to answer. We can only answer with kind of a shrug of our shoulders you know, when they say, well, are we secure? Or are we secure against this? We're like, well, yeah, mostly kind of, but we think so. Well, we can't tell you for certain because we haven't tested it. Um, now, I know you're saying, well, Ben, you're dumb. Pen tests are a thing. And you're absolutely right. Pen tests are a thing. Um, but, you know, I would ask for a show of hands, but we're not in an auditorium. Um, who has an in-house pen testing team? Mm, you know, unless you work for a major corporation, you probably don't. Um, and, you know, very likely it is that you don't pen test more than a few times a year. Okay, got it. And that's fine. You are testing. But, again, we're kind of defeating the purpose of testing if we don't test often. So if we know why we test, we have to figure out how to test. So... That's the thing I'm going to go through here for a minute. I'm going to do some intro, so a little bit of introduction, some concepts, and some terms that I'll use throughout this relatively short talk. But we're going to get into this and talk about what it means to actually understand how you would stand up to an attack and how to define the questions to ask to know, you know, how you would stand up to it. So <clears throat> the point of testing is, yes, to understand, you know, what works and what doesn't in your security stack. Um, but... If you just test willy-nilly, if you do anything willy-nilly, you're not really going to make a ton of progress. Um, maybe you might get lucky, but we don't want to count on that, not, not with what we do. Um, so we do what's called, what we should be doing, by the way, is called threat-informed defense. Okay, And it has three key aspects to it. What you see here, uh, and this is defined by MITRE um, Center for Threat-Informed Defense, by the way. They're there. They're, they do a lot of open source research, very cool stuff, and I highly recommend you check them out. That's MITRE CTID. So... We start off with intelligence analysis, move into defensive engagement of the threat. And when then, you know, when we've gained a lot of good information about, about the threat and our, and our response to it, we do a lot of sharing and collaboration so that the entire organization could benefit from it. This is the top level, this is 50,000 feet. So let's dive in, you know, let's go down a little bit. Intelligence analysis. So we're talking about looking at malware hashes. We're talking about understanding malicious domains, <clears throat> but most importantly, 
we are talking about understanding adversary TCPs. Um, again, malware hashes in malicious domains. If you want to play at the high limit table, you've got to put up the ante. And that's what this is. We are all at the high limit table, folks. Um, and if you don't, can't pay the ante, you're out of the game. So by all means, do your malware hashes and malicious domains. Do your signature-based checking. And that's good. And have that intelligence coming in. But if you are not receiving good intelligence and processing and using that stuff having to do with TTPs and adversary habits of action, um, you're, not playing, you're not playing with the big kids, so to speak. Um, because the adversaries, they are big kids and they are, they are playing for keeps. So intelligence analysis, it's what it sounds like. It's using the right intelligence to ask the right questions. And one way you can go about this is by using the MITRE CRIPS framework, which you see here, uh, attack artifacts, life cycles, uh, malware versus engineering, environmental influences, and that's a whole other talk on its own, but they're there. Uh, and then kind of connecting everything together and understanding what this means in terms of defining what an adversary has done and is likely to do to you. Now, that second piece from those top three that I showed you, 50,000 feet, defensive engagement of the threat. We take intelligence analysis, we get all that good stuff out of it, and we put it into some kind of testing framework. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I work for a breach and attack simulation company. We make, an, we make a fantastic product, I'm not gonna lie to you. Fact is, you can execute your tests in a variety of ways. You can use an automated testing capability. You can use a red team. You can do it in a variety of ways. But the whole point of, take, of doing the intelligence analysis is applying it from an adversarial perspective and an adversarial footing against yourself and understanding the worst case scenarios of all the scenarios you can imagine in terms of your defensive capabilities. This is engaging the threat in a safe way, obviously. And then we go to focus sharing and collaboration. Now, <clears throat> what you're seeing here on this slide are a series, you know, is a set of organizations and centers that do this kind of collaboration because it's what they do, it's their job. Um, but you can also, you also have to look at this as a collab as collaboration inside your organization. Um, it's helping, is making sure the right people know that you've done the intelligence analysis, that you have engaged the threat with your defenses, and that you understand at least something about how you'll perform against them. Because that's how you're going to get fixes done. That's how you're going to get investments made. And that's how you're actually going to gain benefit from being threat informed. And as I was talking about before, MITRE Center for Threat Informed Defense, free open source research. They've got a GitHub, tons of great stuff, a lot of cool projects that they're doing. We're obviously we're part of it. We think it's a good thing to be, we think it's a good thing they're doing. Um, and you know, things like these emulation plan projects, which you'll see there if you go up on their Git, um, are very similar in, na in nature to what I'm going to talk about today. It's, it is a mapping of how an adversary does business and how to emulate what they do yourself. So we have this notion of being threat informed down. Um, and so now we're going to talk about kind of at the, at the basic level how to, how to do that. How, how do I do something? How do I be threat informed? Right, because you, yeah, you are threat informed somewhat if you do intelligence analysis, but you're not really there until you start coming up with test cases and applying them. So how do you build this emulation plan? Those are the test cases. So I might slip into a company vernacular. If I do, um, I'm not going to apologize because I'm giving you the answer key. Scenario, that's a unit test. That is an adversary behavior emulated by any means you choose. You, you choose. An asset, it's a host where you are running your on which you are executing the technique that's it and if i say assessment i mean uh an entire not so much a campaign uh, but a chain of techniques and this is a part of my ransomware talk where i put a picture of a maze because i'm talking about maze ransomware but you know if you didn't gather from the beginning that's not what i'm here to do um, I'm not here to talk about ransomware. <clears throat> as important as it is to understand what ransomware is, it's more important to understand that ransomware is just malware with an encryption module. Ta-da, you're welcome. So let's step on and do something useful. So Maze happens to use uh, as one of its behaviors, um, Bloodhound. Now, if you're not familiar with Bloodhound, it is an active directory reconnaissance tool. It is super cool. I think it's awesome. Um, you know, my red, my, my red team side of my brain says that this is fun to use. And the blue team side of my brain says, well, this is tricky to detect because it uses everything that's native inside. It uses native stuff that's in the OS. And it uses, uh, you, you know, normal global catalog enumeration to find out what's going on in your AD environment and map out your environment. So 
okay, this sounds like something that we should think hard about because if it's, you know, you go that far in your thinking to understand that this is a native tool, you need to put some more analysis into it to understand how you're going to detect it. So what I'm doing right now is describing a single technique because this is how we break things down in emulation planning and understanding how it works because you can't emulate something if you don't know how it works. So in this case, Bloodhound does a global catalog enumeration uh, and there are multiple ways to detect that. Now, you'll need to apply this kind of a detection in a, you know, in a careful way because again, your hosts are generally looking in the global catalog fairly often. But if you look here on the left, there's a sigma rule for it. There's a bunch of them actually. There's a bunch of different ones you can use to detect this. And it's gonna be looking for very specific traffic under in a very specific time frame um, from IPs, you know, from specific IPs. That's gonna say, this is suspicious. Somebody might be enumerating your network. Okay, so we understand right now what Bloodhound does that it is a piece of the maze ransomware, or it can be, it's been used by them before, and there is a way to detect it. Okay, this is where we start. This is from our intelligence digest, right? We, we did our intelligence analysis, we understand this piece about our adversary. Awesome, now we have to plan our test. So we call this assessment design theory. So don't worry about that, but that's just what we call it. <clears throat> so. There are a couple things to go through here before we can really call our, our, you know, our emulation plan or at least our test case uh, complete. So there are some questions to be answered. We have to know which assets we're going to test. We have to know which scenarios or which, uh, which behaviors specifically we're going to run in this case of Bloodhound. And then we have to kind of switch to schedule this thing so that we're getting good data. So we're, you know, we're not, and I'm not irritating people along the way. So test planning. This is when you come up with what we call a problem statement. Um, because, as you know, in IT and InfoSec writ large, uh, we have uh, not, nothing but problems, but, you know, pr predominance of problems, um, and we're just struggling to find solutions to them. So, problem statement. What is wrong that we are trying to get after? What is the threat? What is the risk that we are kind of trying to understand uh, and come to grips with? Well, in this case, we can just make a general statement. You know, we, we haven't seen detections from our AV. We haven't seen, you know, specific rules pop for certain types of traffic. Uh, but we do think things are working as they should be, right? That's a problem statement. It's very broad, um, but it's something you can use to frame out your planning. And so from this, we're going to step into, you know, since we have this context of this problem statement and our intelligence analysis, we're going to make a semi-authoritative statement <clears throat> about specifically what the adversary is able to do and what our defenses are able to do in response. So we ask the question, can Bloodhound scan my environment without me knowing? Well, since we do our we do our level best to you know make things work right and make a defensible architecture and you know configure things the right way, I hypothesize that I believe that the normal that abnormal LDAP traffic generated by global catalog enumeration, which is Bloodhound doing its thing, would flag in my security tools. Okay, cool. Let's test that hypothesis. So since we have a hypothesis to test, we are going to decide where we're going to test it. All right. So the thing is. Since we know or we assume that high volumes of queries from normal, normal domain users will produce an alert on my SIM, I'm going to test across my domain because the environment doesn't really have much of an impact on my detection capability because LDAP is going across your network all the time. So we can put it anywhere. So we want to test it as broadly as we can. So I'm going to pick two workstations from each business unit, um, you know, and they're going to be tested in the context of a domain user because you know, domain users have access to, you know, they, they make those calls all the time. <clears throat> okay, good. Pick those out. <clears throat> we're going to decide which behaviors or scenarios we're going to run. <clears throat> so I'm going to run a Bloodhound ingester right there, bottom right there in scenarios. Pretty simple. We talked about it. Then we're going to come up with a schedule <clears throat> uh, because you don't want to just let these things sit after you do them once. Configuration drift is a thing. I heard my, my predecessor in, this, in these talks talk about something similar. So let's put it on there for twice a month no closer than 10 days apart, just because we want to know, make sure that, you know, things have a chance to change before we test again. Otherwise, we're getting uh, what you might call a uh, high-level false negative. We don't want that. So now that we have, and the, by the way, the most important thing about scheduling is that people know when you're going to do this kind of stuff, by the way. Um, obviously, we schedule out in excruciating detail how we use our red teams, our BAS tools, whatever they are, uh, because, again, people can become alarmed when you start flagging tons of, um, tons of alerts on your security tools. You know, it's, it's good that they're alerting, but people want to know that it's not an actual emergency, so scheduled. 
So if you didn't notice, that took about eight minutes to describe how to design a test case. And it is a broadly applicable thing, which I'll get into here in a second. So we described the theory and application of threat informed defense. We talked to you about how you can immediately start being threat informed. It's a fairly simple concept. It takes some work, it takes some time. It takes a specialist or two, but you, again, you don't, you don't need an entire cadre of cyber ninjas to do this, not at all. Then we broke down that maze ransomware recon technique and we designed a test to check defenses against it. It was all very simple. Um, and this is, this, this is something that should be fundamental to any security program. Uh, the ability to break down a threat this way and describe a means by which you can understand if it is an actual threat to you. So, <clears throat> testing ransomware is good. Understanding ransomware is good. Caring about ransomware, it's, it's good. But being broadly threat informed is better. And if you want to be seriously broadly threat informed and have your defenses aligned that way against you know, the things that are relevant to your mission as an organization, um, you have to be able to test. And to be able to test, you have to be able to analyze a threat, understand what's important to your organization, and actually do something relevant, okay? This methodology is applicable to every actor and every technique. Ransomware is just malware, which falls under that any actor, any technique thing. And I wanna just remind everybody that there's a time to focus on specific threats. But what's important is not necessarily what's timely. And it's something that took me, uh, you know, a good chunk of my, my 10 years in the field to figure out um, because the actors are gonna use whatever they can to get in and you're going to leave stuff open. I don't care how good you are. You could be the Mossad, you could be the NSA, I don't really care. You're going to leave things open. That's why we test it. And if something is open, it's important. Not just because it's something that came across the boss's desk or he saw it in his Twitter feed or she saw it on TV. That said, I encourage you all to be better in 2022, just like the gentleman is saying uh, in the lovely meme. We can do better than focus on shiny new threats and, or, and spend all our time talking about what this latest ransomware family is doing. You know, we could spend our time doing analyzing that ransomware family, understanding what the new techniques are that make, it, that make them different from the things we've been dealing with already, devise tests for those that family and actually be defended against it. All right, I'm off my I'm off my soapbox. I'm gonna recommend a couple of some some re some uh, learning. I can't go anywhere without saying this Tech IQ Academy. It's free, totally free. Tons of training on there. I might have written some of it, so watch out for the stuff that has my face on it. And if you didn't like what I had to say today, uh, if you did, then also look out for the stuff that has my face on it. Um, <laughs> give it a look. We've got over 25,000 students. Great reviews on this stuff. We are always coming up with new material, um, and we want to know from you that we are putting stuff out there for the community writ large for free it is useful that's all we want to do with this so it's academy.attackiq.com and like i said 100 percent free and with that i'm going to stop talking at least for a minute or two great presentation ben really cool stuff attack iq academy i, I i've got to check that out myself i encourage everyone to do that as well um, Great information here. We're going to bring up a poll while we take questions from the audience. The question on the screen for everyone out there is what additional information would you like about Attack IQ? And first question I see here that came in, Ben, uh, they're asking, um, or they're saying decomposing attacks the way you describe is a big lift. How could a smaller team benefit from this? So, any team is able to test. So like, like I said in the beginning, um, <clears throat> testing isn't just uh, sicking your totally BAMF red team on something. Uh, testing is, could be as simple as running a script that replicates an artifact or a behavior that the adversary does. Um, and if you've got somebody, some, sh some sharp you know, person in IT who, who's good at PowerShell, man, you can run a lot of tests tell you what, as long as, as long as manager says it's okay. Um, and smaller teams can always benefit from automation. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of ways to automate testing and I'd be um, <clears throat> remiss if I didn't say that we're one of them um, and one of the better ones, obviously. That said, you don't have to put an entire team on this. 
if you're a small organization, you've got one or two folks who you can commit half of their day to doing this a couple times a week, you can get this done. And you do that by taking small bites. And what I just described today was a small bite. You can look at a technique or a couple of techniques that are of particular import because of the way your architecture is configured, because of the things that your organization does, and test those. And you know, come to a better understanding of what your specific tools are doing for you right now. Um, and you can do these, and there's a ton of open source stuff out there for doing that. Okay. That the yeah, absolutely. Another one here, they say, you know, you talk about a lot of different things as though they're common knowledge, but they aren't necessarily so, at least when it comes to implementing an effective logging, backup, and testing plan. Um, where do we get that kind of information? Any kind of recommendations for resources? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think I've, I've got a bit of like a, there's a specific term in psychology for the kind of bias I have about this, and, I, and sometimes I speak to it, so sorry about that. <clears throat> This stuff should be common. Um, everyone should be looking at the way that, at their architectures from adversarial lens um, more than half the time. Now, resources for doing this are um, accordingly uh, kind of scarce, um, not terribly. I mean, there's, a, there's stuff out there. People care about this, uh, but it's somewhat niche when you start thinking about things in terms of these emulation plans. Um, so the first thing I'll say is Pack IQ Academy. We have entire classes specifically on this. Um, and again, like I said, they're free, uh, and they're pretty darn good. Um, if you haven't seen the blue team or red team, or actually there's a purple team field manual out now, those are great practical application guides for actually doing these things, uh, for, you know, on a keyboard. Um, you know, but again, the best practices you'll find in the major things like CIS controls, uh, even in things like NIST, yes, even there, you can get good ideas about how to how to set up an overall architecture and configure it so that you can um, make assumptions about what it can do, and therefore you can test those assumptions. So, the body of knowledge is out there. It's just not so it's not formalized outside of a few places. Attack IQ being one of them. Okay, and then this is a good question. Uh, do you think folks should focus on ransomware, or should they focus more on just security in general? That you know will protect them from ransomware as well as other threats. I'll say this much. If you don't have a good log, good log aggregation and correlation scheme and somebody in your shop says it's time to go zero trust, um, you should have a very frank conversation with them probably behind closed doors. And when I say that, I mean uh, fundamentals are very important. Um, if you don't have the wherewithal, uh, the technical wherewithal to approach uh, basic threats, or you know, you know, simple antivirus log collection and alerting, um, you shouldn't be talking about specific ransomware threats if you, if you catch my drift. It's not like they don't matter, they absolutely matter. Um, but if you get the fundamentals down and you can, under, you can break down a threat into how it actually works, the things it does that are detectable by your tools, you're on the right path if you can do that. Um, and ransomware simply becomes another piece of intelligence that informs your analysis. Um, the, the, the only notable malware uh, is the malware that has a, you know, a, a unique or novel means of execution. Um, out, you know, and within that, frame, within that frame of mind, you know, everything falls. And if, you're, and if you can break down one technique, you can find ways to break down the others. So, yeah, I mean, yes, should we worry? Yes, you should worry about ransomware. Should you worry about it? No. Should you, should you be aware of it? Yes. Should you worry about it? Well, no, it's like any other attack. Uh, you're going to get breached. So how, how far is it going to get before the tools that you've, that you've properly tested stop it? Wise advice. I like that. All right. Well, I'm afraid we're running out of time here in our live Q&A session, but there's some really excellent questions still there for you in the electronic queue. Ben, um, thank you so much for your excellent presentation today on the Ecocast. Absolutely. Thanks for your time, everybody.